Uh, once again, uh, welcome back uh, yet to another edition of the Long Time um, News Review right here on Star TV with myself, um, Sarah Kamara. Uh, today we'll be looking at uh, some pertinent issues, as you already um, know, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the role uh, that the Red Cross is also um, uh, playing. We'll be um, discussing that with uh, Mr. Dabu, who is from Red Cross, he's right here with us. And then we'll also be talking about the curfew, as you already know, Kao Subaji was out on the first day of the curfew to um, witness uh, what was uh, going on. We'll be bringing you those stories right here on Long Time News Review. And then we will also be um, looking at uh, Nusrat High School, as you already know, hundreds of students on Wednesday uh, protested against uh, their unconducive teaching and learning environment uh, due to their new principal modus operandi. So we'll be um, talking about uh, those two issues right here on Star TV. Uh, first, uh, we bring you this story, as you already know, in an exclusive interview with Star TV. The Secretary General of the Gambia Red Cross Society um, spoke to us about the steps um, taken by them to address the deadly coronavirus and also the difficulties they encounter. Uh, Bintakoli has more on this story. The spokesperson of the Gambia Red Cross Society, Buba Davo, said that the reason behind the Red Cross being responsible for burying nowadays, especially the COVID-19 victims, is to stop the spread of the deadly virus among family members. This, he said, is misunderstood by many people. Well, we are facing a couple of challenges now uh, because the communities uh, could not understand the, the rationale and the idea behind uh, safe and dignified burial. The main purpose of uh, safe and dignified burial is to break the chain of communication, break the chain of uh, infection. That's the main purpose. For example, if your loved one is uh, tested positive for COVID-19, and uh, what we want to, to break is other family members should not be infected because their loved one um, succumb to COVID-19. So we break that chain of uh, uh, contamination. That's the essence of um, SDB. Uh, PRO also gave us a brief explanation of how the burial process starts and how they engage family members who want to take part in the burial process. We normally do what we call uh, community engagement and accountability before any burial. We'll call the family members here We'll agree on the, the, the ritual rites, the burial rites. If it is a Muslim, they will tell us all the rites uh, according to Islam and according to their culture. If it is Christian, they will also tell us all the rites uh, and all the religious rites to bury. So we make sure we follow all these things uh, in our burial. But we are facing a couple of challenges now. Communities are saying, no, we are burying their people wrongly and so on and so forth. But we are making them to understand and then we are also changing our strategy and the strategy is now we are including the family members themselves into the burial. If they want to wash the body, we dress them in the PPEs and we guide them how to wash the body. If they want to do the burial, we identify, they identify four other members of their family members that we will also put in the PPE and they will help, will guide them to do the burial. So this is the process now we are doing. And so that people will not misconstrue to say we are burying people that are not their family members. In fact, some of them are saying, how can we be sure that you are burying our family member? We have to open this uh, bloody bag to see whether it's our love or not. He refuted the allegation making rounds on social media and a sort of their commitment in executing their duties. For Star TV News, I am Bintakoli.
This plan was developed and uh, with the support of our headquarters in Geneva, uh, we uh, received some assistance in terms of financing to start the operation. So we have been doing uh, first and foremost community engagement and risk communication. Even before schools closed, we were, our volunteers were involved in uh, sensitization in schools, in communities, and in public places. Now, apart from that, uh, we develop a plan that will respond uh, in terms of uh, when people get uh, uh, positive, uh, we transport them. Uh, we have our ambulances that have been transporting some of the pos positive cases from lo one location to the other. Uh, we have our volunteers who have been trained and prepared to work with the Minister of Health in terms of uh, uh, other aspects of the response, uh, particularly when it comes to contact tracing uh, and then, of course, when it comes to safe and dignified barrier. humanitarian response, which is the more in terms of mitigating the effects of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, where we have supported uh, families uh, with uh, some livelihood interventions. And uh, this has been done. Uh, we've also provided hygiene material and equipment to different places and different institutions, and uh, including the fumigation of uh, many institutions and households. So in, a, in, in summary, we are really uh, complementing what government is doing as an auxiliary because this was uh, in the first place the mandate of the Red Cross in the Gambia even before COVID. Uh, the magnitude is, is so big. I mean, the, 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 the challenges are that uh, people are not uh, uh, responsive enough. There is so much denial about it. Uh, probably what is responsible for that uh, could be uh, the whole myth around COVID. And this is not uh, uh, only in Gambia, but it's all over the world. Uh, but I think uh, as time goes on, we need to think through in terms of our risk communication strategy uh, because that's the only way we can adapt uh, to better understand how people think and then approach it in a different way. But uh, by and large, the challenges, is really related, challenges are related to uh, lack of uh, acceptance by many of Gambians. Okay, um, thank you very much. That was uh, the Secretary General of the Gambia Red Cross um, Society um, talking about the role uh, that the Gambia Red Cross Society is uh, playing right now, which is uh, very crucial um, in this um, global uh, pandemic. Uh, well, I have uh, Mr. Buba, uh, Mr. Buba Dabo, Mr. Dabo here uh, with us. Uh, Dabo, uh, we've seen right now the role that um, Red Cross is, is playing. Uh, which is uh, very, very uh, crucial. And then, um, although people thought that um, you just started playing the role now, but according to the Secretary General, um, since uh, the outbreak, we have seen um, Red Cross, um, the role that they were playing, it, it included um, fumigating, you know, um, offices, premises. Um, I can remember even one time at Star TV here, uh, it was fumigated by the Gambia Red Cross Society. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. as an organization and uh, maybe according to the ex uh, Secretary General we are auxiliary to the public authority that yeah. means um, we only complement what the state is doing in terms of uh, humanitarian actions in this country yes we started uh, well before uh, I can say well before the government yeah. because uh, when this disease outbreak uh, was announced in China uh, because that's our everyday job, working on emergencies. 
So we develop our contingency plan. Mm. And then we further uh, develop our contingency plan into a scenario based plan. Uh, what that means is uh, if you develop a contingency plan, it guides you what you need to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then also to help you to mobilize resources, adequate resources for your humanitarian response. And what the scenario based plan does is if the situation is evolving, what do you need to do at each stage of the evolving nature of a pandemic or a disaster or an emergency? So this uh, we developed and we, we have the third um, phase of our, our scenario base. Okay. Um, this starts with uh, last week when the, the cases start sorting up. Yeah. And then we have to review our scenario base to make sure that uh, now if we are in level one, if the situation storms to the worst case scenario, what do we do? This is how we manage emergencies and disasters at the right okay. And that's why up to now we don't have any infected person among us, either staff or volunteers, because we have a, a very strong um, operating standard operating procedures, as well as we follow based on our, our scenarios. So we have been doing a couple of issues, as SE highlighted, um, starting from uh, Sensitizing people on how to do proper hand washing. Proper hand washing, exactly. And yeah. then we move from that end to fumigation of public places and even commercial vehicles. Okay. We started with that. And uh, then we don't record any dead cases as a result of COVID 19. Yeah. And if you look at the National Contingency Plan of the Gambia, the primary mandate of the Gambia Red Cross in that particular plan is we are solely and totally responsible for safe and dignified burial. Okay. And globally as well, the Red Cross movement is responsible for the safe and dignified area. And that's why currently when many people are succumbing to, to succumbing to the, the to the COVID nineteen COVID nineteen. Um, we activated our SDB teams. We call them SDB teams and they are doing uh, burial processes for families that have uh, lost their lives. Okay. Uh, what is the experience like? Uh, for example, uh, you have the volunteers. You know, um, those who volunteer to come in and then um, carry out this process of burying, you know, people. What is the experience like? And then uh, you also look at their families. Okay, uh, what is the concern? You know, um, raised by their families because now COVID nineteen, you know, there is always a stigma, you know, associated with it. Um, thank you so much. I I think this question is very important, but uh, the driving force behind the Red Cross volunteers is the passion. Yeah. And I think this is uh, acknowledged and accepted by their family members. Most of these volunteers have been volunteering in the Red Cross for a couple of years, two decades, some of, some of them ten years, some of them even three decades. And uh, they've gone through a couple of uh, serious emergencies. One of those is major life operation yeah. for those that are witnesses. I'm sure so you are a volunteer yeah. all the time. Yeah. And uh, that was more horrific to say, sorry to say that word, yeah. but uh, burying somebody 10 days after you ask to reassume the body for reburying, Rebury. that's, uh, that's a nightmare. For COVID, it's an infection disease that is transmitted to individuals. Um, we've not uh, experienced uh, such complaints from them because they have been tried by the Russian. Okay. Uh, when it comes to preparation, of course, we train them and we orient them on a daily basis. Each day of our actions, we do what we call the Okay. What went wrong, what went right, how can we improve on those that went wrong so that tomorrow we will not uh, repeat those mistakes. So that's how we looked at the operational context of this COVID-19. Okay, uh, but, but do, you also, do you also console yeah. their family members regarding COVID-19? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What we are doing now is uh, we are reaching out to uh, the volunteers that are currently doing uh, COVID-19 operations. Yeah. We're providing psychosocial all of them, and this is uh, supported by the Minister of Health through the, the National um, COVID-19 Response Subcommittee called the Social Committee, headed by uh, Bakari Sonko. Okay. So he's providing this uh, social counseling. And our next move is to move to these, the parents or the families of these particular volunteers, yeah. because they are moving from the Red Cross to their families. So, but to stop um, these um, psychological issues within the families, uh, we are accommodating these volunteers okay. in our town okay. as they are doing this operation. So if you are on a roster, we 
make sure that you stay with the hotel until when your period is over, and then you'll go through these processes before you join your family. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, now let's come to the uh, victims, for example. Um, most of these burials, at the end of the day, you know, um, what role has Red Cross has to play? Is it only to go and bury the disease and then finish? Do you come back to the family, console them, fumigate, you know, the place, etc.? Um, thank you so much. Um, most of these bodies, uh, we move some of them from the communities to the mortuary. We move some of them from the mortuary to the burial site. Now, what we do if we receive a report that somebody died as a result of COVID-19 or a suspected, suspected COVID-19 case, we will engage the family. Uh, we have a committee. We have a team called uh, Community Engagement and Accountability Committee. Yeah. So that committee specifically is uh, their specific role is to make sure that uh, they work with the family. One, to sensitize them. Two, to make sure that they understand how we do this uh, SDB burials. Three, to agree with them, both their religious uh, practices and their cultural uh, ideologies regarding how they uh, prepare their bodies. Then, if we agree with these uh, family members, then we will also ask them if any of them is ready to wash the body that is Muslim. Then we will prepare that individual part of the process. For three other family members, we also be part of the process, uh, process for burying the family. Okay. Then in the process, we disinfect the members that have interaction with the body before they go back to their family members. We disinfect the body itself, and we disinfect the volunteers that have interaction with the body. And we disinfect the vehicles that we use to transport, to transport the bodies. So we make sure at every level, and all the materials that we are using to this exercise are disinfected before they are next, they are used next time. So that means we are breaking the chain of uh, transmission of infection okay. from one person to the other. Okay. And that's that's the process of uh, the SDB stuff. All right, because sometimes people people you know feel the fear um, of you know um, going to the family members you know to pay their condolences because they will say it's COVID if I go there. You know, I can you know get 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 the visas exactly. Um, I am no, I don't think that's a, that's a something um, people should fear from because mm. normally what happens if the uh, the person died and is tested positive, uh, normally the environment is disinfected. So if the family members are still there and they are not showing any signs and symptoms of COVID, obviously people will not have the Respect. Okay, so but there, there are, distancing yes, must be, must be, must be practiced. Okay, uh, and and then there are no testing conducted, you know, in that particular compound, um, so that to to, to find out where the one or two, you know, of course, sort of if have it. Uh, suspect is um, registered among families, all those family members that are primary contacts, yeah. to because every suspect has what we call the primary contact and contacts of the primary contact contacts. The primary contact. So the, all the primary contacts would be tested, for sure. Okay. Because they have physical interaction or social interaction with the, the suspect. So they will be tested and they will be quarantined for the period of 14 days. And they will be retested again whether they have the COVID-19 or not. Okay. If they don't, then they will be released back to their family members. But if they do, then they will also be following the treatment. Okay. So the target is the, the first primary contact. So the primary contacts, if any of them is also infected, infected exactly. then they go to the, the, the contacts of the primary contacts. So that's how the contact tracing is, 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 is being done in, in this process. Okay. Uh, so um, Red Cross, uh, do people call you or you call people? How does the process go? Uh, for those that are confirmed, we receive yeah. a call from the Okay. who is uh, in charge of our treatment of this uh, COVID-19 by the right. Normally calls our SDB team. But we also receive calls from the community, particularly people nowadays, people will be walking and they will drop down and die. We have uh, almost about six cases of that in the community. 
Yeah. In the Gambia. In the Gambia. And they, they will call us <coughs> and then go and pick the bodies and move them to, to, to the Bible to, to confirm first. If we move anybody with that case, we move you to A and E for you to be confirmed by doctors that you will die. And then we move you to the mortuary. We just don't move people from the community to the mortuary because we don't have the capability or the mandate to announce somebody dead. Okay, but do you also contact the families of that? Normally, yeah. when people call me, people will call us, and then we go once yeah. it is identified that the family members now will know okay. that their loved one is picked somewhere and is now in value. And they will, they will follow the process with them uh, for possible barriers. Barrier. But all these cases, they will take the samples. Mm -hmm. But what we don't want is to bury somebody without knowing. Then the Gambia would not know. The impact the of COVID. COVID. Okay. So that's why all the, um, those that dropped and died, they will uh, collect their samples, test them. If the results come positive, then we will know the number of uh, cases that the Gambia registered over the period. Or if they are tested negative, then we will hand over the body to the family for the uh, for burial. Okay. Uh, so how many confirmed bodies have you buried, and then how many of them are confirmed to be, you know? Um, COVID-19 and those are suspected? Um, yeah. I might not tell you exactly the, the, the exact figure because yeah. what the government publishes is 16, 16. or 19 so far. Yeah. 19, uh, bodies, uh, 19 dead bodies as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. What, what I can tell you comfortably from last week Tuesday, not this last week Tuesday, last week, Tuesday. Today, today. We did a burial of almost about uh, 56. 56 burials. Yes, including mm. those that are positive and those that are um, suspected. Suspected. So all together is 56. And 56. It could be more than that because today, as I'm coming from the office, yeah. there are some burial processes that are also happening. Okay. As a, on a daily basis, uh, we bury on average six bodies. Six bodies. And it's across the country. Some of the bodies we bury them in their villages. Yesterday we we buried one in Farafene, um, another one in uh, Fuoni in uh, uh, what I call it again is a uh, uh, Bajana. Bajana, okay. A couple of uh, bodies. All in all, from last Tuesday to yesterday, we buried 56 bodies, oh. and this include positive and suspect. A suspected case. Yeah, because what we don't want, the mortuary was full to capacity, and then uh, families could not wait for the results, and therefore we bury all of them as suspected COVID cases before the results are out. Otherwise, uh, if people did not receive their results, you allow them to bury their own loved ones. We cannot break the transmission chain. So okay. That's why we are burying everybody as suspected. And that's why we are saying positive and suspected case altogether in 66 months. Okay. Uh, now, um, let's come to the rituals. Um, you mentioned here um, that um, you allow family members, you know, if they want to wash the body, anything that they want to do, you know, they can do it with you people and then you disinfect them. Because there was, you know, people, you know, rumors, you know, some of them would say we are, they are not receiving proper burials, this and that. You see, anything you do, you will have uh, people that would uh, complain. And these are not, uh, in fact, elderly people, yeah. or these are not uh, responsible people. All the complaints or the rumors we are having are these small boys behind them. Yeah. We will not bury anybody in this country without the involvement of the family. Okay. Every person that we bury, we must first do what we call community engagement and accountability okay. with the family members. And all the bodies we bury are washed by the family members themselves because we put them in the PPs and their loved ones will not even recognize them. Okay. So after the burials, when they do the dolphin, they do, okay, this is our man. Oh, this is my brother. That's the only time they know. But before they, they see that, they will start giving out a lot of information. Misinformation, exactly. Yeah. What, which is not true. And they cannot go back to, to the community again to say, what we have said before was wrong. Okay. So this is how we go about our, if the family definitely want to wash the body, we will put you on the PPEs, and then you will wash. Two or three of their family members will wash the body. Okay. 
and they will do the right thing as the Islamic way of doing it. Okay. And then we put the body in the body bag yeah. and then zip it so that there will be the cotton, uh, this connection this connection yeah. between people and the body. Even if there is interaction, then people will be seen because the entire body and possible infection would be trapped in the body bag now. Okay. And then the body bag would be disinfected. So if people have interaction with the body, yet still people will not be infected. Okay. okay. So that's how we support and we also do the burial with the family members. Okay. Okay. Uh, now um, let's talk about uh, the resources. Um, the resources um, is it you know given by government or you know um, your main Red Cross your body in Geneva? Yep. Um, to tell you the truth, uh, since we started this operation, uh, the Gambia government did not give us uh, physical liquidity. Okay. That means physical cash. Physical, in terms yeah. of support our operation. All that we are doing is uh, support from uh, EU International Federation of Red Cross, the Canadian government, okay. individual Gambians and businesses okay. are the ones that are supporting whatever the Red Cross is doing. Yeah. All that you are seeing in the social media and here in, on the news and the radios, they are all supports from these uh, different individuals, Gambians, businesses in the Gambia. Our international movement, Red Cross movement, EU, and also the Canadian government. What the government of the Gambia is doing is uh, providing all the environment to operate, which is uh, uh, dictated by the laws of the Gambia that establishes the Gambia Red Cross. They are also providing the PPEs, and then the two vehicles we are using for the SDBs are also provided by the Gambia government mm -hmm. and their drivers. So they are staying with us at our office to do this. Uh, but when it comes to fiscal liquidity, no. So the the numeration that we are doing for our volunteers are also for support from uh, these three big donors, EU, Canadian government, and International Federation of Red Cross. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and then I've often seen that um, you go with the media sometimes, you know, when, 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 when yeah. you're doing these barriers. Yeah, the media, the purpose of the media was uh, because we want to dispel these uh, rumors, we have been talking about it on the radios, on tweets, on Facebook account. But yet people are denying the fact that uh, uh, people are doing burial, not a proper burial. People are denying. So we want to do a short documentary for people to see and hear, to know exactly what we have been saying and what is exactly happening is different. That was the purpose of the media following the, the SDB, so that a short documentary can be can be generated, prepared, and presented for people to, to know what we are doing. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have uh, my colleague here who is Yankuba. Uh, Yankuba, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kamara, and then I'm sorry for coming late. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any question for Mr. Dabo? Yes, sir. Um, you explained that the Gambia government hasn't given you any physical cast. Uh, does, how does that affect your work? If in terms of because I know your operation, you may need support, and that the government has made supplementary appropriation bill, giving support to health workers and others, leaving out Red Cross. Um, I'll tell you one thing: uh, by the laws of the Gambia that establishes the Gambia Red Cross Society, the Gambia Red Cross is supposed to be a subvented organization, like NDMA, like Nana, like all other organizations that are established by law. We should have been subvented, but unfortunately we have not been subvented so far. But the uh, process has been going on to, to, with the government to make sure that uh, we, are also, we also receive our subvention as other organizations. We had a meeting with the National Assembly members. We also wrote to our land ministry regarding all this and also to the Minister of Finance. Um, as I said, the Gambia government creates the environment for us to operate. And then we look for resources through our structures to make sure we operate. How it affects our operation, we, we, we are facing some challenges uh, as we speak now because the two of the vehicles we are using are the only two double cabins that we are using. That means that's why we still have a backlog of cases of the mortuaries that we cannot still bury because we have only two mobilities that are in this service. And the uh, day before yesterday, I received a call from the uh, Logistics and Safety Committee of the National Response Task Force what is the, the gap in terms of uh, 
mobility we were required to do this exercise and I told them three new three uh, additional single cabin pickups to support our process and uh, that's 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 what we are now so we are we're facing challenges and um, even the volunteers are overstretched for now so we are training a couple of uh, 60 additional volunteers to be added to to the SDB team so that uh, they can be on safe Okay, um, just just to make a follow up, looking at looking at it because we've, we've, we've seen the assistance provided by Gambia government, you know, to ministries, departments, right? Don't, don't you think it was also wise for Red Cross also to, to be provided because of the crucial role that Red Cross is playing right now? Yes, we definitely, okay. we definitely would need uh, Gambia government to support us, particularly uh, if it comes to the engagement of our volunteers, because these are individuals that are not um, at least uh, being paid by the Gambia Red Cross Society. We are only giving them um, an hour once and all of their line services, workers. and they are frontline, exactly. at, uh, very at high risk of uh, contracting the disease. Uh, but what we don't want at the Red Cross is for the ministry to pay directly to our volunteers, to interact with our volunteers directly. This we don't. Okay. What we want, if the government wants to support these people, they have to follow the processes and the channel of the Gambia Red Cross Society. Because we have our mode of operanda, we have our instruments, our legal instruments, we have our policies, we have a volunteering policy, we have volunteer policy and volunteering policy, and then we have a volunteer code of conduct, we have our humanitarian code of conduct, and then we have our finance procedure manual, we have an internal regulation. So if the states want to support, they will tell us, okay, Gambia Red Cross, this much we have for you for supporting your operation. And then the Gambia Red Cross, within its um, legal instruments, would provide those services to the volunteers and report back to, to the Gambia yeah. government. So we don't want to be part of a government coming giving money to our yes. volunteers. That can um, create some impact. Uh, on our legal instrument, our internal regulations. Okay. So we are open, if government is ready to support the Red Cross, it's fine. But they have to follow the due process as an organization which is independent, because we, uh, in our service delivery, we are independent. We are not independent of the government, for say, because it's the government of the Gambia who establishes the Gambia Red Cross. And in the same law they establishes us, it is clear that our actions, our doings, our interventions must be independent of the government. So if the government wants to support, they can support us independently, and we return back to them independently. Okay, um, finally, uh, what advice do you have for, for the Gambia government and for, for Gambian people in general regarding COVID? Um, COVID is something that is here to stay with us for a couple of time, and people should uh, realize that and start uh, preparing themselves for that. And then these are uh, 14 days coming could be a turning point, a very crucial moment for the Gambia. Initially, we were saying the COVID-19 is between Western Health 1 and 2, but people have moved for this feast. They went all the way throughout the country, and we don't know who was the carrier. And now these uh, 14 days coming, which is the first 14 days incubation period, we may see a couple of cases coming out. As I explained at the beginning, we have now seen people dropping on the way. They will be walking and dropping, dying. So these are all signs of uh, a crucial moment of these 14 days, which every Gambian should prepare yourself with. Both mindset, social um, ramifications uh, will be there. Then we need to prepare ourselves very well, and people should take this seriously. People should be with their mask and constantly washing their hands. Because uh, the surface, we, we will always touch surfaces. surfaces. And we don't know which surface is contaminated mm -hmm. or infected. So always we need to be washing their, our hands before we touch our eyes. Of course, these are the, 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 the areas that uh, you may uh, contract the diseases. So Gambians, I, I want to appeal to them to, to follow the guidelines of uh, WHO and the Gambia Minister of Health, but also support the Gambia Red Cross Society in, their, in our drive to make sure that uh, we do uh, what we are doing so that we can do it better. And also we, we are able to 
uh, motivate our volunteers. This is something very crucial. Okay. If the population can help us to motivate our volunteers, yeah. it will be wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was Mr. Buba Dabo, the PR of Gambia Red Cross. Disaster, uh, management. disaster management. Disaster management. Yeah. Okay, the disaster management. Uh, well, um, we go to the other edition of the program, as you already know. Um, in, in the light of the growing seriousness of COVID-19 uh, situation in the Gambia, the Truth uh, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission has decided uh, to suspend its public hearing uh, till further notice. The suspension will take effect from the 4th of August 2020, said uh, the Chairman of the Commission, Dr. Lamin J. Sise, in a statement. Daru Cham tells us more. Uh, the Chairman says that the decision to suspend hearing was reached after careful consideration and consultation at the level of the Commission and between the Commission and the Minister of Justice, at a time when the number of COVID-19 cases in the country is rising at an alarming rate. The Commission is deeply concerned about the safety of both Commissioners and staff of the TRRC, as well as its media partners witnesses, security personnel, and indeed all members of the public. During the period of the suspension of public hearings, the chairman assures that uh, the various committees of the commission will continue working on their various agendas. Uh, the commission will also continue working on putting together some aspects of the final report. Therefore, the commission secretariat will also remain partially open for their staff that will be coming to work on a roster system and others will work from home during the period of suspension. The TRRC encourages all members of the public to take all cautionary measures to keep themselves, their families, relatives, friends and communities safe from the coronavirus, to always wear masks, wash hands regularly with soap or use hand sanitizers, observe social distancing and follow all other guidelines recommended by the World Health Organization and the country's health authorities. Reporting for Star TV News, I am Dado Cha. Okay, uh, <laughs> story. Uh, well, we've seen um, Yankuba TRRC have uh, suspended, you know, um, uh, the hearing right now uh, due to the coronavirus. Uh, but some people might say, okay, uh, they should have done it, continue it, you know, in close door sessions. Uh, very well. Um, people's opinion, uh, people can always express their opinion. Well, it is very important for always non-experts to listen to experts. Yeah. Uh, the chairperson of the TRRC has indicated in his statement that uh, in consultation with the Ministry of Justice, and the Ministry of Justice is the line ministry for TRRC, uh, that it is better to close than to operate. If it is uh, the will of uh, each member of the TRRC, they will have completed this TRRC 2020. And still, they are they are with the hope that they will be completed in 2020. They have their mode of operation. They have their schedules. That is the uh, say, the teams that they will be hearing. Um, this is not the first time they close. They open. They close for the first time and open, thinking that the TRC, uh, the COVID-19 will have been at least uh, curtailed. But we have seen a very very. Um, high increase of the number of cases um, in, in just less than a month we have how many cases over 400 cases in just less than a month so these are things that people must not um, be complacent with we should always take or heed to advices of the uh, health experts we advise to do social distancing we are advised not to do close contacting we are advised to stay at home these are all advices. There are people there, and people will come to TRC. It is a, it's a public institution that people will have interest in. Uh, people will always um, observe, or will sit and watch. Some will like to go there. So these are no one knows who is a potential carrier, and this is a virus that does not have physical that you can see and say this one has. Yes. Yes. So these are things that uh, to avoid that. The TRC is better to close as advised by their experts, and I think it is a good decision. Okay, uh, but what about to have a closed door session, for example, um, not to invite the public, you know, but televise it on television station like um, QTV is doing, GRTS Paradise, and you know, others, and then just you have the commissioners together with the with the witness. But who, who is safe? TR, uh, one can ask. Mm -hmm. Who is free? Who is immune from the TRRC? Is it the commissioners? Is it security? Is it the cameraman of the TV? These are things. If you do closed door, you still bringing people together. 
So we are saying people should avoid being together. I, the witness, or, or even whoever comes there, who may not even be part of the public, the person can be a potential carrier, who knows? We see ministers yeah. who have expected the minister to get COVID-19. So all of them are getting the vice president of the country. So, so to avoid this, we cannot be complacent. So the experts are saying people should stay at home. See, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has closed. And then uh, we are expecting other ministries to close. COVID-19 is actually a trouble that people must not take a chance chance. Uh, we must always um, be ready for it. It's, it's either you do what they say or you, you face the consequences. Okay. Look at the Gambia, for example. Uh, in, we have our first case in March. Up to June, we are having less than 20 cases. Mm -hmm. So after June, see now, how many cases do we have? We have a thousand plus. So what does that tell? We are not doing what we are supposed to do. If not, uh, it will not have reached here. Because, for example, the borders are, are not uh, well secured. People are coming in and out. Yeah. So these are situations that we must try to defeat. To defeat this, we have to do as advised by experts. Okay. This is a, it's a, it's a situation that is not... Uh, people, no one wants, no one wants this type of situation, to stay at home, or not for, for public institutions to close. It is affecting the country, it is affecting individuals, it is affecting businesses. So in order to defeat this, it has to uh, be a collective approach, that uh, public institutions close, people stay at home, uh, people do, uh, people wash their hands, faces, uh, wear face masks and other things. Regulations are for the people, not for the government. So this is what people will not understand. People will like to blame the government. For example, right now, every, everyone you see is wearing this thing. And so, yes, you see some writing saying, if you wear this, your oxygen will be finished. And these are things that are non-expert advice. So people must not listen to them. So you have to listen to experts. The closed door session is undesirable. Okay. We need, the, the TRS is closed. Uh, there's administrative staff and other things can continue, other people can continue with their work. Uh, with, with the proper... Uh, sanitary materials there. I know they have it because I have been there. So people can come there, give their statements, their offices are open, but still the hearings can close. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yankuba, as the president declared a 21 day night curfew from from 10 to 5 a.m., law enforcement officers apprehended over 90 offenders within uh, Congo in the first night. Some of them claim uh, to have been unaware of the degree of the president. Uh, Council Baji was there to see how the public comply with the curfew and Zabin Koli now reports. The emergency measure which restricts the movement of people began 10 p.m. Thursday. It will continue for the next 20 days starting from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. daily. Only persons on official COVID-19 duties, ambulances and public officials on essential assignments are exempted from the curfew. Anyone who violates the curfew commits an offense and is liable to a fine of 5,000 Gambian dollars. At Westfield, as the curfew was about to kick in, only a few people could be seen scrambling to get home. Regardless of the short notification and fear of police brutality, others succumbed. Star TV observed public adherences and police professionalism in the first night as lawbreakers were interrogated before being arrested and taken to the nearest police station. About 100 people, mostly youths, were arrested by the police last night as Star TV witnessed. They were later taken to the police station for prosecution for the fine of 5,000 Gambian dollars. In another development, the Office of the Inspector General of Police on their Facebook page expressed profound appreciation and gratitude to the public for the high level of compliance with the curfew regulations as demonstrated in last night's operations. The IGP's office is pleased to report that it has successfully conducted day one of Operation Save Our Souls without any major incident. The public is further encouraged to stay at home, adhere to regulations, use face masks and support efforts of the security in curtailing the further spread of the coronavirus in the Gambia. Jacqueline Coley, reporting for Star TV News.
sorry, uh, in the story, uh, that was the uh, story regarding the curfew, as you already know, um, declared uh, by the president. Uh, we've seen some people have been apprehended, uh, but most of them um, are not aware, most of them are not aware, you know, um, regarding the president degree, according to them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the police PRO. Uh, okay, I think we have the police PRO uh, with us. Um, hello? Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hello, how are you doing? I'm fine, I'm fine. Thanks for having me on the program. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you too. Thank you for having me once again. Okay. Uh, well, we want to uh, talk about uh, the curfew, as you already know. Uh, we, we know that uh, there are some offenders who have been already apprehended. Uh, what what has the police taken? Uh, and like you said, the coffee has been going on from day one. And like you said, uh, the Ghana Police Force has launched an operation that we call Operation Save Our Souls. And in this um, operation, we are ensuring that um, people are here to be um, the coffee regulations also the um, compulsory face mask wearing regulation and, and many other accompanying regulations that are there towards the um, enforcement of the COVID-19 prevention government. And so far, um, uh, from the two days of um, operation that we have done, actually the compliance level is very high and we definitely commend the general public for that. Okay. But, however, we have also um, um, encountered situations where individuals got arrested across the country. Okay. For example, um, we are getting the report, um, uh, let's say the Philippine Security Unit have arrested about 18 people okay. and 11, 11 people that are impounded by them because of in the court regulation. Hmm. And also when we go all the way to Brussels, We'll see that the party on day one they have arrested 15 people and they have also arrested 16 on day two. That is during their party, that's the people who were out um, during the coffee hours. Yeah. And then also uh, at Brikama, so far we are getting more reports coming in, but so far we have recorded up to 14 people that have been arrested also in Brikama. Okay. The anti crime unit also have arrested about um, 12, 12 people and did a certain number of people for flooding the corporate regulations as well. Okay. If you go all the way to CRR as well, we have arrested about 20 people. You know, Sierra has Sierra North and Sierra South. And so on all sides of the, the, the region, Factors they are conducted and about 20 people have been arrested so far as well. Okay. All these arrested individuals are processed accordingly and they will be charged accordingly as far as the, um, the court regulation is concerned and they will be put before a competent court of law and eventually they will be uh, prosecuted. Okay, um, how long, how long uh, is the prosecution going to take place? Um, do you already, have, have they already been taken to court? Hello? Sorry about that. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah. My question is, have, yeah. they already, have they already been taken to court? Sorry about that, Dr. Chad. Hello, I'm getting you. Hello, I'm getting you. Yes, I said, um, uh, those who are already apprehended since day one, um, have they been taken to court? Yes, already some of them have been arrested in court um, um, on Friday. And, and, and the trials continue. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Fiero, thank you very uh, much. Yes, uh, what about Nord Bank? What about we don't think for activities are going on, but we are getting the reports coming and we have got them, but uh, we are telling which you are going to be when we get them. So when we get them to we'll share with them, I will share with you are coming. Yes, sir. Okay, what, what, what are the specific uh, instructions given to your men who are doing this coffee, um, uh, listen, the night patrols? The instruction is very clear and that is they are doing according to the law, the regulation, um, 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 that supports the coffee. And you understand that uh, this is a lot of 
5 o'clock a.m. Uh, people who are people's movement have been restricted, except people who are mentioned in the regulation that is the police frontliners and um, the medical personnel, as well as those who are giving public uh, based on the essential services that they are uh, um, uh, running during those hours. If you don't fall under those categories and you are found outside, then you could, you should be arrested and prosecuted for flouting the regulation. So, so, so um, those arrested um, yesterday, that is um, Friday, they will be arranged on Monday. And have they been granted bail or what is going on right now? Are, are they still under custody? Well, so far, um, that is to the discretion of the police station. Um, and and, and uh, within the period of 72 hours, they will be either set on uh, um, temporal police bail to report. Or even if they are not set on bail within 72 hours, it is still within the law. Yes, sir. Okay, um, my final question is, have you received um, any negative complaint regarding how uh, police are handling um, these people who are in offenders? Have, we received what? have you received any negative complaint regarding the way uh, police are handling this curfew? So far, we've not got any complaint about the handling because we are ensuring that coordination is really going on okay. and instructions are very clear as to arrest people's welfare, their human rights, and the fact that uh, all these things need to um, take place or in accordance with the um, rule of law. And so we are ensuring all this and um, we we'll make sure that people who are arrested are processed accordingly. And so we've not got any negative um, reaction from the public or from any individual concerning the way he or she is that. But when we get it to, we will uh, deal with it accordingly. Yes, sir. Piero, um, you, you discussed about the operation Save Our Soul. Can you explain what that uh, op uh, the operation means? And then so the people will understand it. Very well, like if you know COVID-19, the figures are going very high. And um, um, uh, at the beginning, we have seen that the COVID figures were like one, two, three, four, five, and so. But in recent time, we are counting hundreds and up to thousands now. Mm -hmm. So the Army Police Force feels that in going out to enforce now, it has to be a strict enforcement. And though that strict enforcement will be geared towards saving the soul of Gambian people. Because COVID is so devastating that it could it, it result in people dying on daily basis. And so to save people from dying, we have to come up with an operation that will save the souls of Gambian people. And so this is why our regulation of enforcement this time around is very strict. Whoever is caught will be dealt with according to law. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Piero, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was um, ASP, um, that, that was Superintendent Lada, um, Lamin Jai, that was the police uh, Piero, who was on the phone. Uh, we've, we've, we've seen the, the number of people uh, who have been arrested um, right now. I think um, almost about, uh, we have 18, 11, 14, 12, vehicles also have been um, seized and I think people should should be aware you know um, of this curfew um, people saying they are not aware of the degree um, issued by the president one would say um, maybe they're just joking absolutely I, I don't I don't I don't think uh, any person in, in the Gambia who is there any I don't think there's a person in the Gambia who does not know about this although we are given 48 hours notice. That is, the announcement was made on Thursday, Wednesday and the implementation began on Thursday. So, people must understand that uh, coffee, this, I, I'm, I'm never aware of history where Ga the whole Gambia is declared there's a coffee that this time and this time that you should not go out. So, there's a situation that uh, the country is faced with that requires such drastic measures. Yeah. And this measure will include the 10 o'clock to five o'clock, uh, pe people must be inside their homes. So if we have this in place, and that it is announced, media publicity everywhere, you claim that you don't get it. I, I don't 
see anything there. Because anywhere you see, you see people with masks yeah. throughout the country. Yeah. You see people with masks. What does that tell you? If you are interested to know, you'll ask the person, why are you wearing masks? Mask? Mask? The person will inform you that there's a regulation that you should wear masks. Then you try to get it. But you are seeing people with masks, you don't end the world of get masks. You are, seeing, you, are, you are not seeing people outside, and you are outside, you don't ask what happened. Then I think uh, you are trying to be... Uh, I think your, 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 yeah. your excuse must not be, I don't see it genuine. It is not a genuine excuse, exactly. Yeah, so people yeah. must understand that this, the police, the, the regulations are for the people, not for the police. The police are trying to get people who offend the regulation and then uh, take them to the court. It's not the police who's going to uh, apply the co okay. law, yeah. it's the court that is the going court. to apply the court. Exactly. So if the police take you and then it's, the court will still ask you for a plea. Are you guilty to, to, to the offense? You said yes or no? If you said no, the police will prove it. If you say yes, then the court will find you. That is the procedure. Yeah. It is there to save people. And then I think uh, that this operation Save Our Soul is very important. Very important. Yeah. Uh, the police, uh, yesterday I have been two out. Since the implementers, I'm always out till four. Okay. I, I, I'm always outside moving around to see what they do. Yes. I have seen how they, because many have approached me asking me my card. Because you know the press are exempted. The press are exempted. So yeah. I'm always outside. Yeah. I'm having many Tupabaras and many circular areas, and I've seen what they are doing. Yeah. The army, what they do. But I can assure you that they are very disciplined. Yeah. And I'm seeing, uh, I see that people are complying, as the police said, the compliance rate is very high. Yeah. Even though some were arrested. Well, I think with time, people will understand we'll that understand the regulation yeah. is for them, not for the police. And then yeah. people will stay at home by that time. Yeah. The yes, but one will also say um, 10, why not bring the time down, you know, let's say 7, 8, 10 o'clock. Yes, uh, I think, yeah. I still, I'll, I'll still repeat what I said, expert advice and non-expert as well. Yeah. <laughs> expert will apply, yeah. apply reasoning and conscience yeah. based on facts based and evidence and what they think is right. Yeah. Non-expert will rely on evidence, uh, sorry, opinion, opinion yeah. that may not necessarily be, be guided by uh, good reasoning. So every person with a sense of self-preservation will agree with expert advice rather than, rather than yes, uh, uh, apply uh, yeah. yes, sentiments. Because I see non-expert advice as sentiment because it does not have any basis. Experts will rely on this uh, a situation and then they cannot ask people to stay at home the whole day. Mm. So I think it's very important that we apply what experts uh, or we adhere to expert advice. Yes. Okay, I guess uh, time is again spurred so on our news review program. Um, any final words? Yes, sir. Th thank you very much. And then uh, the situation as presented by the Red Cross, you will see that Gambia is faced with a very serious situation mm -hmm. that people must adhere to the health advice and people should stay at home. The, the regulation is not by the president, but it is by the situation. It is uh, the situation that brought about the that regulation, so yeah. people must adhere to it. Yeah. Okay, okay uh, thank you very much, uh, Yankuba, and we thank, uh, that is, Abuba uh, Dabo of the Red Cross, who joined us uh, during the program. We also thank the police PRO, you know, for uh, being part of the program. Well, listeners, uh, this, rather viewers, this is what we have for you in this edition of the uh, weekend lunchtime news review. With me, Sarah, and Yankuba, we say bye-bye to all of you until next Saturday. Bye from us.